In the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, starting in verse 9, it reads that Jesus was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus said himself that he is the light of the world. Still in John chapter 1, in verse 10, it reads that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Jesus is the eternal creator. The world was made by him, is how it reads. All of the beauty of creation comes from the mind and from the heart of God. Jesus is that creative genius behind every sunset and every ocean and every stream and mountain all of the animals and all of the plants and every star in this great big universe, he designed it all and he created it all. And also he holds it all together. Jesus is our God and our God, he is beautiful. But just like it reads there in John chapter 1 and verse 10, the world knew him not. Now the reason why the world doesn't know its maker or why the world doesn't understand its creator is because of sin. Because of sin, this world has lost touch with its creator. Instead of beholding his beauty, man looks to other men, governments and rulers, and we expect man to solve the world's problems. Instead of trusting in God's word, sinful, fallen man has vainly imagined that man knows best. That modern science and human logic can solve all of the world's mysteries. And that mere men will solve all of the world's problems. But mankind can never fix the biggest problem that this world faces. The world in all of its modern science and human wisdom can never regain a right relationship with its creator. Not without any divine intervention from the creator. The great chasm between man and God, the great barrier that separates us from our Creator is sin. Our sins have separated us from our God. And mankind, no matter how smart or how intellectual he may be, or how charming or even how moral that we may be, man can never fix the problem of sin. We just can't do it. All of our efforts to cleanse our own sins without any help from our Creator, all of those efforts are futile. So God sent us His light. And that light is His own dear Son, Jesus Christ. And specifically, Jesus came unto his own. Jesus came to the Jews. Again, in John's Gospel, in chapter 1, in verse 11, it reads that he came unto his own, that's the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, the Jews, they didn't receive Jesus, even though Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the King of Israel. After being witnesses to this light, to the saving power of Jesus for some three years, the religious leaders in Israel had Jesus arrested at night without any charges against him. They received him not. They had Jesus tried in six different court appearances. 
In three of the six trial arrangements, Jesus faced the various religious courts in Israel and they found him guilty. They received him not. And then, in the other three trial arrangements, Jesus was handed over to the Roman procurer at the time whose name was Pontius Pilate. Jesus appeared before Pilate, then he was sent to Herod, and then back again before Pilate. In his trial before the Jews, Jesus was found guilty. In his trial before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, Jesus was declared to be innocent. The religious leaders in Israel had found Jesus guilty. In a Jewish religious court of law, he was declared guilty of blasphemy against God. Their charge was that he made himself the Christ, the Son of God. But when Jesus stood before the Roman government, before Pontius Pilate, Pilate said that I find in this man no fault at all. Uh, but Pilate, he was a weak politician. He cared more about the people's demands than he did for justice and fair judgment and truth. And so Pilate handed Jesus over to be scourged with a Roman whip. And then he sent him off to be crucified, even though Jesus was innocent, even though he was an innocent man. Under Roman law, the criminal that was to be executed, he was required to carry his own crossbeam of the actual cross that he was to be hung upon. The whole cross with the standing beam and the crossbeam together weighed over 300 pounds. Some criminals would have to carry that whole cross. But the crossbeam by itself was just about 100 pounds. And Jesus was beaten so badly that the Roman soldier who was driving the criminals out to their place of execution had a bystander carry Jesus' crossbeam for him. Mark chapter 15, there in verse 21, it reads, And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. Again, under the common law or under the Roman law, the Romans had placed this stipulation upon the people. And if a Roman soldier had tapped anyone on the shoulder with his sword, and he demanded that they carry the soldier's burden, then whatever it was, if it was a bundle of sticks, or if it was his bag, or anything that he had, then that person was required to carry the soldier's burden for one mile. It was the law. After that, he could drop it, and then he wasn't required by the law to carry it any further. And that's why Jesus told his disciples, or he told us, to go the extra mile. And that's also why this soldier had placed Jesus' burden, this cross being part of the wooden cross, that's why this soldier had Simon of Cyrene carry the cross. The distance from the Praetorium to the hill for his execution the place called Golgotha is an estimated 650 yards, which is just less than a half a mile. Now, Simon was from the north part of Africa. He was an African. And he was probably there in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration. But now Simon 
he finds himself bearing the cross of Christ Jesus our Lord. And I believe that this encounter with Jesus changed Simon's heart forever. I can imagine that Simon stayed throughout the whole crucifixion and he heard everything that Jesus had spoken from the cross. The fact that his two sons are mentioned there in verse 21, Alexander and Rufus, that could indicate that Simon's sons are the same men who are mentioned in the book of Acts and in the book of Romans as being part of the early church. They were believers. And so Simon probably had a great influence on his own son's salvation. Now reaching this place just outside of Jerusalem, the soldiers had laid that cross beam upon the ground, attaching it to the longer beam that stood upright. And they laid Jesus' body now upon the wood as a sacrifice unto God, a sin offering to cover the sins of all of humanity, or rather to remove our sins completely. Mark doesn't go into all the details of the torment of the crucifixion, but they may have tied Jesus' arms up to the crossbeam before they drove those spikes into his hands and into his feet. Some people say that they were driven into his wrists instead of his hands to prevent the nails from ripping out of his hands as he hung there on the cross. A certain Frederick Zugabi has suggested that the nails may have been driven into his hand at an angle, entering into the palm in the crease that delineates the bulky region at the base of the thumb and exiting into the wrist passing through the carpal tunnel. At this angle, the criminal could have hung on the cross with the nails in his hands and in his feet for several days. And this was part of the slow torture of the cross, the Roman crucifixion. The criminal's arms would go out of joint as the criminal would begin to slouch forward to the point where he would begin to suffocate. And in order to keep himself alive, he would have to keep pushing up on that nail that was driven into both of his feet and trying to pull himself up also by the nails that were in his hands at the same time. Our English word for excruciating gets its origins from this torment, this form of Roman capital punishment. Excruciating would mean then out of crucifying. The word crucifixion, it means to fasten to or to fix to the cross. And this wasn't only a form of torture, but this was also such a a heinous act of humiliation that the Romans believed that the cross was a great warning and a great deterrent to many criminals who would otherwise have caused dissension against Rome. It was a great deterrent against crime. This form of execution may have been around since about the 6th century B.C., But in the year 337 A.D., the Roman emperor Constantine I, he abolished the crucifixion throughout the Roman Empire out of his reverence for Jesus. He was a believer. The myrrh that was mixed with vinegar from verse 23, that was somewhat of an act of sympathy from the Roman soldiers. It would have had a numbing effect on the body of Jesus. So if Jesus took it, if he drank that, then he might not have felt the pain as much from the nails or as much pain from the scourging and from the beating that he had just gone through when he was hanging there on the cross. But Jesus didn't take it. Jesus felt the full effect 
of the pain of our sin. The Roman soldiers had also stripped Jesus bare of his garment and they cast lots for it, which would have been something like drawing straws to see who got to keep his robe. In this play for his garment, it was also predicted back in Psalm 22 in verses 16 through 19. It reads there in the Psalms, in Psalm 22, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and they stare upon me, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. And where it says in verse 25 that it was the third hour, this means that it was now nine o'clock in the morning. The trial hearings, they started and they ended within just a few hours in the early morning. Even though the Jewish law had stated that a verdict couldn't be declared for at least 24 hours after the trial proceedings. This was humanity's reception of Christ Jesus, the Son of God, into the world. Their reception was that they killed him. Mankind tortured him. And we all gave our verdict against him. We all pronounced a death sentence against the Son of God. The whole world has been declared guilty of sin. Sin against God. In verse 26, it says that there was a, a superscription posted over his head and they mounted that to the top of the cross. This superscription would read what crime it was the condemned man was guilty of. And the Jews had argued with Pilate after the fact and they wanted the writing to be changed from the king of the Jews to this man only said that he was the king of the Jews. But Pilate wouldn't change it. He said, what I have written, I have written. And I believe that this superscription was another mockery of the Jewish religious leaders' condemnation of Jesus. And that was the final verdict of his crime. Jesus was condemned and crucified because he was the king of the Jews. Mark fifteen twenty seven. it reads, And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And that prophecy or that prediction of his death is from Isaiah chapter 53 in verse 12. It reads there in Isaiah, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And even though this was God's act of love, it was God's act of love for sinful men, those men still mocked him and they ridiculed him and they tortured him and they crucified him. In Mark 15.29, it reads, And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, and saying, O thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself, and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. 
And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And the sixth hour would have been high noon. Jesus had already been on the cross for three hours. Many of the details of his crucifixion are left out of Mark's gospel, as Mark is emphasizing more on the works of Jesus. And I believe that the whole crucifixion story here is short and it gets to the point that Jesus paid the price for our sin. He did all the work for us on our behalf. And we see in verse 29 that the crowd mocked him in his labor of love. They said, save yourself. And in verse 31, we see that the scribes and the chief priests mocked him again. They said, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Which I think is an admission on their part of the saving work of Jesus during his public ministry, they admitted right here that he saved others. But they still had him scourged and they still had him crucified. In verse 32, we see also that the two thieves that were crucified with him, they reviled him also. Doesn't read what they said, but they mocked him also. And all of these people, the crowds, the religious leaders, the criminals, all of them, he came to save. And and even though he could have, he wouldn't save himself. He wouldn't save himself for their sakes. This was the action at hand. This sacrifice is for their salvation. But they only mocked him and ridiculed him and reviled him. In verse 33, it says that at high noon or at the sixth hour, the sun was blocked out from the sky and the land became dark until the ninth hour or until three o'clock in the afternoon, 3 p.m. Three hours of darkness upon the land. And I don't know if this was the same kind of thick darkness that had plagued the land of Egypt during Pharaoh's contention with Moses or with his contention against God. But I do believe that this darkness on the land would have gotten the attention of everyone. The sky turns dark at high noon and stays dark for three hours. It's recorded in Luke's Gospel that when they had arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he had called this whole grisly event their hour of darkness. And I believe that Jesus was speaking of a spiritual darkness on their part, an evil on their part. In Luke twenty-two fifty-three. He said there in the garden, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretch forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. On their end, it was a time of wickedness, their slaughter against the Son of God. But on his end, this was a time of his offering. As the whole land was shrouded in this darkness, it's almost as though Jesus was now going behind the veil to offer the blood of the sacrifice upon the mercy seat to make an atonement for the sins of the people. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus said that he calls us his friends if we do whatsoever he commands. We do those things that he asks of us. In these three hours of darkness, this is when Jesus was bearing the full weight of the judgment of God against sin. 
This is when Jesus suffered the spiritual desolation and separation from his father. That's why he cries out in verse 34, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark 15, 34. It reads, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I don't think that we can even comprehend the agony of this moment. Not with our finite minds. Not as mortal men. We can't comprehend what was going on when he bore the full weight of our guilt and of our shame. When he who knew no sin became sin for us. When he was willingly forsaken of the Father so that he could offer himself as a sacrifice for our wickedness, for our filth, for our guilt. He did this for you. He did this for me because of my sin. I don't think that anyone standing there understood the impact of this moment, neither. In verse 35, Mark 15, 35, it reads, And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he, call, he calleth Elias. And that was because he said, Eloi, Eloi. But that translated, that's Aramaic, translated, that means, My God, my God. He wasn't calling on Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. In verse 37, where it says that Jesus cried with a loud voice, the words that Jesus had said when he cried out are recorded in John chapter 19 and verse 30. It reads, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And what Jesus had finished was the act of salvation. As the great high priest of our souls, Jesus had gone in behind the veil and he made an acceptable offering for the sins of the whole world, for your sins, for my sins. That's why it reads in verse 38 that the veil in the temple was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. God had instructed the Jews in the times of Moses to make this veil about four inches thick. And I read in one account that the veil here in Herod's temple was believed to be about 12 inches thick. It would be impossible to rip this veil. No man could have torn this veil. No earthquake could have torn this veil. God tore this veil. God ripped the veil from the top going downward. The veil was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide and possibly 12 inches thick. The veil was meant to keep sinful man out of the throne room of God or out from the presence of the holiness of God. 
When Jesus offered His body as a final sacrifice for sin, the access then to the very presence of God, to His very throne, it's been made open and available for all mankind. Sinful man may now approach a holy God through the torn body of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the veil that was rent in two. Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus had completed the work that He had come to do. Jesus had glorified the Father in this great act of obedience. In this great act of a righteous judgment against sin. And in this great act of love for humanity. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. The fact that it reads that he gave up the ghost, that means that no man took Jesus' life from him. But he laid his life down of his own accord. This was a voluntary act of his will. It wasn't an involuntary act of breaking his body. Something that was out of his control. Jesus had given himself completely. Jesus gave Himself in the garden. He could have called down 10,000 legions of angels to assist Him, to rescue Him if He wanted to. But He wouldn't. Jesus gave Himself at His trial. He could have opened His mouth and justified Himself declaring His own innocence. He could have. But He wouldn't do that Neither. And Jesus gave Himself at the cross. He could have saved Himself. He could have come down from the cross if He wanted to. This is Almighty God. But He had purposed to give Himself from the very beginning. And He finished the work that He came to do. In verse 39, it reads that one of the soldiers that stood by, a centurion who was more of a higher ranking soldier, and they were known for their nobility, he acknowledged the beauty that he had just witnessed in the death of Jesus. In Luke's Gospel, it reads there that he called Jesus a righteous man. Surely this was a righteous man. But both Matthew and Mark read that he said that Jesus was the Son of God. And he had probably said both. Which means that this centurion, he may not have had saving faith, but at least he acknowledged that Jesus was a righteous man and that he was the Son of God. And I'd like to think that he was saved also. But we can't be too sure from just what he said. Some people acknowledge who Jesus is but they don't apply that to themselves. He's my God. He's my Lord. He came to save me. In verse 40, it reads that there were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Which means that among the disciples of Jesus, there were several witnesses of his death. And I can imagine that Peter was probably somewhere in the crowd, hiding. And we know from John's Gospel that John the Apostle was there. But Mark makes it a point to mention the presence of these women who were Jesus' disciples also. Most of the men were hiding out for fear of their own lives. 
But many of the women were there at the crucifixion because of their great devotion to Jesus, and they put their own lives at risk because of their great love for him. I imagine some of the accounts of the crucifixion were told to the gospel writers by these same women. They probably helped to fill in some of the details. These women who were watching the whole thing. Mary Magdalene was there at the crucifixion. And she was also there at his empty tomb three days later on Sunday morning. All three of these women were some of the last ones at the cross. And they were also the first ones at the empty tomb to see the resurrected Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene was the, was the woman whom Jesus had cast seven demons out of her body. And here, she's a reliable witness to the crucifixion. And then later, she's a reliable witness to the empty tomb and to his resurrection. Verse 42, it reads, And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, and he, that's Joseph, bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. Now, without going into a lot of detail, I believe that the crucifixion of Jesus was on a Thursday afternoon rather than on a Friday afternoon. It's a good Thursday rather than a good Friday. And like I had said before, this would have given Jesus the three nights in the grave, just like he said, three days and three, and three nights. And, and no matter how you work it, a Friday crucifixion would only be two nights. And here in verse 42, it reads that there was a preparation day before the Sabbath. And that would be the day that the lamb was slaughtered in the temple, the preparation day. And this would be on Thursday, which was one day before the special Sabbath holiday or the Passover Sabbath, which would have been on Friday. Friday was a holiday Sabbath. And then you would have had the regular weekly Sabbath on Saturday. So there were two Sabbaths in this week. On this Thursday, on the day of preparation, Joseph of Arimathea had felt this urgency to go to Pilate before they discovered the dead body of Jesus. And then they might have taken him off the cross themselves on the Friday, which was a holiday Sabbath, or on the Saturday, which was a regular Sabbath. If he was taken off the cross on the Sabbath, it would have been unlawful for the Jews, for Joseph, to prepare his burial on either of those days. So he felt this urgency to ask Pilate for the body immediately after Jesus had given up the ghost. Now, if the Romans had taken Jesus down from the cross on the Jewish Sabbaths, they might have thrown his body into the city dump. Most all of the dead bodies of the criminals were thrown into the trash heap just outside of the city wall. So Pilate allowed Joseph of Arimathea to take the body after he made sure that Jesus was really dead indeed. There's actually two different words here used by Joseph and Pilate. Joseph asked for Jesus' body. Pilate granted him his corpse. 
Pilate thinking that he's dead and gone forever. In verses 44 and 45, Pilate had marveled that Jesus was already dead. Even the two thieves on both sides of Jesus weren't dead yet, and they broke their legs. They broke the legs of both of them to speed up the crucifixion process. It was an act of mercy. But since Jesus was already dead, a Roman soldier took a spear and he ran it up into Jesus' side, up into the cavity where his heart was. And according to John chapter 19, in verse 34, it reads, but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water, which many people say was a sign of a ruptured heart. The water sack bursting around the heart and then pouring forth blood and water. Some people say that Jesus died of a broken heart. Now, sometimes death would occur within just a a short time after a man was hung on the cross, even within an hour. But it would be possible for a stronger man to keep himself propped up by that nail in his foot and the nails in his hands without suffocating for even days at a time. A literal review by Maslin and Mitchell identified scholarly support for several possible causes of death by crucifixion. One possibility would be cardiac rupture or heart failure. Or the body could go into shock due to heavy blood loss. Another possibility is acidosis, which is too much acidity in the blood causing death. Another possibility would be asphyxia or erythemia, which is death by suffocation. Or even pulmonary embolism, embolism, which is a blockage of the main artery to the heart or to the lungs. In this review, Maslin and Mitchell said that death could result from any combination of those factors or from other causes, including sepsis, following infection due to the wounds caused by the nails or by the scourging that often preceded the crucifixion, eventual dehydration, or because the criminals were left out overnight at times, a predatory animal could attack them and kill the man who was nailed to the cross. The legs were often broken as an act of mercy to the tortured person by hastening their death. When they broke their legs, they couldn't prop themselves up any longer, and they would die quicker by suffocation. Now, all of these are possibilities for the crucifixion. But if any of these symptoms were the cause in the death of Jesus, in his case, it had to be planned out by Jesus rather than having taken him by surprise, as though death was by some accident or some involuntary bodily failure. Jesus gave himself, is what the scriptures say. Jesus offered his own life. He said, I have the power to lay it down And I have the power to take it up again. When Joseph took the body of Jesus, he had the help of Nicodemus. He was one of the elders in Israel also, a Pharisee, who had come to Jesus at nighttime beforehand. Both of these men were probably members of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, currently at this time or at least some time before this. And it says in verse 43 that Joseph was an honorable counselor who had looked forward to the coming of the Lord. And so the Lord obviously had been speaking to him about this event. Nicodemus had helped to clean the body and to anoint Jesus with several pounds of ointment and then they wrapped his body in linen cloths. Joseph had then placed Jesus in his own tomb that was set apart for himself. 
It was a small tomb that was carved out of a rock. It was a rich man's tomb. And they rolled the great stone over the entrance of the tomb. The tomb would have been sealed then from predators and from possible grave robbers. And Jesus was buried in the grave. He was laid in the ground. Again, in verse 47, the two Marys had fearlessly followed the body of Jesus to see where they would take him. They witnessed everything, and it's obvious that their devotion and that their love for Jesus wouldn't deter them from following him wherever they took him, even at the risk of their own lives. These women, they're a great example, even to us men, of fearless devotion to Christ Jesus that's motivated by love. The body of believers, I would say that we're tremendously blessed by both men and women who show such steadfast devotion to Christ Jesus. You know, this kind of love, it's, it's encouraging for us. The love that these women had for Jesus. But listen, these women, they were motivated first by an even greater love for them, for the women. And that was the love that Jesus had for them. You know, my prayer is, is that all of us would be moved and motivated and that we would be convicted and corrected and that we would be driven to no end by the love that Jesus has for us. This is the love of God. Jesus Christ, our sacrifice. The Apostle Paul, he had a prayer for the church at Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 3, in verses 17 through 21, he prayed and he said, My desire is that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And in 1 John, in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle John, he wrote, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He certainly loves us. This is His proof that He loves us. Don't ever doubt God's love for you. If you ever questioned it, do you really love me, Lord? Just look to the cross. That's where He proved it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your, your sacrifice. That you would give up your life for us. That you would go through this humility. That you would go through this agony and this suffering. The nails. The crown of thorns. The mocking. The spitting. As a sacrifice for our sins. This is because of my sin, because of the wicked things that I've done wrong in my life. Thank you, Lord, so much for Jesus. In his name we pray. 
Amen. All right. God bless you guys. Have a great week. <laughs> see you on Thursday. Oh, no, oh, oh. no, we're not going to see you on Thursday. Have a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next Sunday at 1130. God bless you. <laughs>